Welcome to Feminist Question Time, uh, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender, identity, ideology. There's more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 33,967 people from 160 countries and is supported by 474 organisations from all over the world. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 60 country contacts, and they, I'm going to read to you some of the countries where we have country contacts, Australia, Serbia, Croatia, South Korea, Spain, Canada, Germany, Argentina, Portugal, Ukraine, Denmark, India, Slovakia, Sweden, Netherlands, Brazil, Italy, Japan, Peru, Dominican Republic, New Zealand, USA, Bolivia, Mexico, Greece, Lithuania, UK, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, France, Ireland, Bahamas, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, Indonesia, Russia, Finland, Singapore, Cameroon, Turkey, Andorra, South Africa, Chile, Poland, China, Belgium, Slovenia, Colombia, Austria, Malta, Tunisia, and welcome to our new country contact from Taiwan. So we have um, country contacts in all those countries. And it's really important that we spread this message and we share and we network and we get to know one another internationally so we can share what's happening and what works and what doesn't work um, so we don't deal with this on our own in our countries. Um, this is happening globally and, and so it's great that we're managing to do that. So if you, if, if your country wasn't named in that list so you can uh, apply to be the country contact in your country and we can continue this international networking. I'm so pleased today that we have Kay Yang, the D programmer from USA. She's going to talk about exposing the United Nations worldwide agenda of female erasure. We also then will have Linda Blade from Canada on the launch of the International Consortium on Female Sport. Then we're going to hear from Anna Hidalgo from Spain on gender identity, ideology and girls from schools to hormones. And then our fourth speaker is Silvia Carrasco-Pons from Catalonia. And she will also talk about gender identity, ideology in uh, and girls in schools. I'm now going to introduce our first speaker which who is Kay Yang the D programmer it's completely fantastic just a total honor that you're coming to speak to us you um uh, Kay Yang's um a former trans rights activist and LGBT non-profit whistleblower um she's going to share her original research exposing the United Nations worldwide agenda to erase sex-based rights so she's going to use official documents and propaganda issued by the United Nations demonstrate how the UN sustainable development goals otherwise known as the 2030 agenda outline a plan for worldwide female erasure and it will end with a brief report back from the first ever women's demonstra demonstration against the UN's coordinated uh, erasure of sex specific language so it's just um it's just a great honor if you haven't seen Kay Yang in other videos I absolutely recommend this is not going to be long enough to really hear everything <laughs> or even part of what she has to offer she's absolutely brilliant so thank you so much Kay and um over to you a short disclaimer, if you are so compelled and you have the means to do so, here is a list of ways to support my work. So I'm a completely independent artist, writer, filmmaker, activist, organizer, and research. My work and my views represent only myself. I'm not on the payroll of any nonprofit or commercial business, nor have I been paid or commissioned by any private interests to do this work. I'm drawing upon my personal experience as an organizer and activist of over 20 years and utilizing skill sets I have developed to uncover a hidden and plain sight worldwide gender identity agenda being constructed at the expense of the female sex class and child safeguarding and our sex-based reality. 
Okay, the League of Nations is said to be the predecessor of the UN. It was formed at the Paris Conference after World War II in 1929 and officially began in October of 1945 when it was ratified in San Francisco, USA. By April 20th, 1946, the League of Nations had ceased operations. China, France, Russia, the UK, and the US are original signatories who ratified the charter, bringing the UN into existence, and those five sovereign states have been granted a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Here's a look at a map depicting the level of global reach the UN had when it began in 1945 with 51 members. In contrast, a quick look at the UN's reach today, they have over 193 member nation states. In 1946, the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls was established. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly in Paris on the 10th of December and described by its creators as a common standard of achievements for all peoples and all nations. The first convention on political rights of women was held in New York City in March of 1953. The first World Conference on Women uh, held in 1975 focused solely on women's issues and was held in Mexico City. 1975 was named the year of the UN year of the women and the decade to follow was named the UN decade for women. A report was issued from the first world conference of the international women's year. Um, the report stated a specific purpose of eliminating the discrimination eliminating discrimination on the ground of sex and promoting equal rights of men and women and condemned, quote, sex discrimination as fundamentally unjust. In 1979, a treaty called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was internationally adopted and formally signed in 1980 by the UN General Assembly. In 1987, Our Common Future, also known as the Brundtland Report, was published in uh, October by the UN in 1987. In, the term, in it, the term sustainable development was first defined as, quote, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The Rio Earth Summit was held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992, where sustainable development terminology first began to take root. The agenda for the 21st century, aka Agenda 21, was an outcome of the summit and is described as a comprehensive plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally by organizations of the UN system, governments, and major groups in every area in which human impacts on the environment. In September 1995, the year of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, the Fourth World Conference on Women was uh, produced the Beijing Declaration. The Beijing Declaration does not mention sex except for within the term sexual health. The declaration mentions the following gender-related terms, quote, gender sensitive, gender equality, and gender perspectives. The Millennium Development Goals were eight international development goals for the year 2015 that have been established following the Millennium Summit of the UN in 2000 at the UN headquarters in New York City. The purpose of the MDGs was to discuss the role of the UN at the turn of the 21st century. The terms uh, gender equality, gender issues, and sex each make one singular appearance in the UN Millennium Declaration. Notice here, uh, maternal health and gender equality are separate goals within the MDGs, indicating the uncoupling of biological sex from gender and the term woman. Jennifer Billick of the 11th Hour blog has done extensive work exposing the money behind the Arcus Foundation, tracing it through multi-billionaire heir John Stryker to the Fortune 500 Medical Technology Corporation Stryker, founded by John's grandfather, Homer Stryker. Writing for Gender Descent, Felicia Rembrandt traced nearly 900000 of Arcus grant money, some of which was funneled through the Tides Foundation to ARC International. 
ARC website describes 20, 2009 to 2010 as, quote, a pivotal period as we moved into the implementation phase of the UN human rights reform process and work with NGOs to address the implications of these reforms for LGBT equality rights, build global support for the Yogyakarta principles, and develop a coordinated strategic vision for advancing these issues throughout the years ahead, end quote. ARC International is a Canadian-based propaganda and lobbying firm whose public records show their first donations received from John Stryker's Arcus Foundation financed the propagation of the Yogyakarta principles. The Yogyakarta principles were developed and unanimous, unanimously adopted in 2006 in Yogyakarta, Indonesia by a group of so-called human rights experts, including judges, academics, former UN High Commissioner for UN Rights and uh, UN Special Procedures, members of treaty bodies, NGOs, and others. The principles are a document about human rights in the areas of sexual orientation and gender identity. They have no formal legal weight themselves, but they do gain legal weight when utilized by states and human rights mechanisms like the United Nations. The Yogyakarta principles define gender identity as, quote, each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth, including the personal sense of the body, which may involve, if freely chosen, modification of bodily appearance or function by medical, surgical, or other means, and other expressions of gender, including dress, speech, and mannerisms. Robert Wintermute was one of the original 29 signatories of the Yogyakarta principles and has publicly admitted, quote, uh, publicly admitted in a 2021 20, article in The Critic, the issues of access to single sex spaces largely affect women and not men. So it was easy for the men in the group to be swept along by concern for LGBT rights and ignore this issue. 2010 marked the year of the establishment of the UN Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, known as UN Women. The UN press release announcing the creation of the UN Women contains no mention of the term sex and 13 mentions of gender within the term gender equality and gender issues. In July of 2011, the UN Human Rights Council adopted the first resolution containing the term gender identity, although the term was not defined within the resolution. Resolution 17-19 mentions the term gender identity five times. In December of 2011, the UN issued its first report specifically on SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity. The report issued by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights states that the committee refers to the Yogyakarta principles on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity as a source of guidance on definitions. In July 2013, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights launched UN Free and Equal, described in their words as an unprecedented global public information campaign aimed at promoting equal rights and fair treatment of LGBTI people. The UN Free and Equal is the United Nations global campaign against homophobia and transphobia. The Free and Equal campaign defines gender identity, again, as a deeply felt and experienced sense of one's own gender. They say everyone has a gender identity, which is part of their overall identity. A person's gender identity is typically aligned with the sex assigned to them at birth. Um, transgender is also ident uh, described as an umbrella term, which includes transsexual people, cross-dressers, sometimes referred to as transvestites, and people who identify as third gender. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aka SDGs, were adopted by all 193 UN member states in 2015 as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development.
The SDGs are to be universally applied to every country and person by the year 2030 and are comprised of 69 targets that are broader in scope and more far-reaching than the combined goals of its predecessors, which were Agenda 21 and the Millennium Development Goals. The SDGs cover three dimensions referred to as economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental protection in the name of sustainable development. Sustainable development goal five is to, quote, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. SDG number five is the same goal with almost the exact same wording as Millennium, Millennium Development Goal number three, which was to, quote, promote gender equality and empower all women and girls. Notice the change in the symbols used to represent the same goal. You'll notice that SDG five specifically refers to women and girls and not to females, except when it comes to the topic of genital mutilation. Why is that? Well, being a male or a female is a biological determination, meaning it refers to the chromosomes and sexual organs that one is born with. Whereas being a woman is a gender determination, which is much more fluid, complex, and subjective. The way SDG 5 is written is for all gender equality and for the most part includes anyone identifying as a woman or a girl, regardless of the biological sex they were born with. So goal five, gender equality, cuts across all 17 goals and explicitly includes male people, men and boys within the definitions of women and girls. Many programs working on gender equality are not intersectional or inclusive to all women, for example, trans women. So when I speak about women and girls, I am being inclusive with the use of the term, but I think it is important to recognize that that might not always be the case in practice. And this is why we have the Leave No One Behind principle in the 2030 Agenda, which aims to put the most vulnerable first, and it's so crucial that we do that. The voice you just heard is the same woman who was speaking before. The UN has endorsed a principle of leave no one behind as part of the 2030 agenda. Unlike prior development goals, the sustainable development goals apply to all nations. And these two principles combine to constitute a mandate that all states include LGBTI people within their development efforts. In 2015, the UN issued its first report on sexual orientation and gender identity. The report cites the Yogyakarta Principles definition of gender identity. Once again, the position of the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity was created through Human Rights Council Resolution 32-2 in June 2016 for an initial period of three years. In 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Council created the mandate of the independent expert for protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, the IE Sangi. Since then, a lot of important and groundbreaking work has been done. The goals of the independent expert's mandate are to research, examine, and provide visibility to the violence and discrimination experienced every day by gay, lesbian, bisexual. Victor Madrigal Borlos was appointed as UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity in late 2017. The IE SOGI mandate was renewed for another three years under resolution 41 18 in June 2019. A 2019 IE SOGI report endorsed recommendations from the UN High Commissioners for Human Rights, which advised that the process of legal rec recognition of gender identity should be, quote, based on self-determination, simple, recognize non-binary identities that are neither man or woman, and, red flag, be made available for minors. In 2019, the UN Human Rights Council put forth Resolution 40-5, duplicitously titled Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and Girls in Sport. 
The resolution refers to women and girl athletes with differences of sex development, androgen sensitivity, and levels of testosterone, with the claim of the, quote, right to equality and non-discrimination and full respect of bodily autonomy and integrity. Resolution 40-5 recognizes that sports regulations and practices that discriminate against women and girls on the basis of race, gender, or any other ground of discrimination can lead to the exclusion of women and girls from competing as such on the basis of their physical and biological traits meaning that using physical and biological traits is not an objective means of classifying if a person is a woman or not, because it could lead to the discrimination of biological males who are included within the UN's understanding of women and girls. The resolution also called upon states to ensure that sporting associations and bodies implement policies and practices in accordance with international human rights norms and standards and refrain from developing and forcing policies and practices that force, coerce, or otherwise pressure women and girl athletes into undergoing unnecessary, humiliating, and harmful medical procedures in order to participate in women's events and competitive sports and to repeal rules rules, policies, and practices that negate their rights to bodily integrity and autonomy. The very terms women and girls are meant to be understood to include males with penises and testes, which are referred to as, quote, differences of sex development. According to a 2019 IE SOGI report, Bodily autonomy and integrity, quote, affect particularly intersex and trans persons. And the definition of bodily autonomy and integrity is of fundamental importance to trans persons, end quote. The report goes on to say that it is every state's duty to establish no invasive preconditions to legally recognize a person's gender identity by way of self-determination, also known as self-ID. In 2020, 2020, the government of Pakistan has become the first country in the world to include a man legally recognized as a, quote, transgender woman within a delegation sent to the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women held in Geneva. Uh, the man's name is uh, Aisha Mughal, who works with the Ministry of Human Rights in Pakistan. Another video, this time from a UN women expert. So let me start with saying that trans women experience violence four times more likely than cisgender people. So in 2021, during a campaign called 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, UN women expert and policy and program analyst Miriam Modalal answered the question, why do people think trans women and cis women don't deserve the same protections and rights? The uh, answer began by describing women with the qualifier of cisgender, claiming that so-called transgender women experience violence at a rate four times higher than that of, quote, cisgender women. Okay, I'm going to uh, go into a little bit of a report back from the UN on March 16, 2022, a nonpartisan international group made up of individual women and women's organizations dedicated to defending the sex-based rights of women and girls gathered on the occasion of the UN's 66th session on the Commission on the Status of Women to protest the UN's erasure of sex-specific language and protections for female people, women, and girls. The event was organized and produced by myself with vital support from Amy Souza. I want to give a thank you to all of the women warriors who supported with their attendance and otherwise, Beth Stelzer, Amanda Stuhlman, Isabella Malbin, Jessica Gonzalez, Jeanette Cooper, Jennifer De La Sega, Joy Gray, Gina Hoke, uh, Jenna DeQuarto, Jen Ziggin, Amy Crete, Arlene, and our special guest all the way from the UK, Kelly J. Keen. The women registered a voice of non-consent for UN policies, resolutions, and campaigns that include the concept of gender identity into the definition of sex, 
thereby eliminating the possibility of identifying females as a biologically distinct group from males and diminishing sex-based protections for the most vulnerable women and girls around the world. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development promises to make human rights real for everyone, everywhere. It has 17 goals and gender equality cuts across all of them. Women say no! Women say no! The of females in the name of gender identity is being perpetrated on all levels. Being bankrolled and institutionalized by supranational governing bodies like the United Nations, the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainability Goals. US to UK, women say no way! The UN is not fit for purpose when it comes to defending the rights of Hold the line! Hold the line! We're here today to stand for all the women of the world engaged in struggle against the trans agenda. The American Global Respect Act, which I just affectionately call the anti foley Parker Act seeks to eliminate international solidarity building organizing effort by the women of all the world. Males who identify as women are replacing us in sports, scholarships, public office, the boardroom, you name it. They are forcing themselves into our formerly private sex-separated spaces. If we do not stop playing nice and start getting real, real yeah, soon, yeah. We will find ourselves in a position we are no longer legally or socially allowed to even mount a resistance. The United Nations encompasses over 15 global agencies, which include the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank Group, and the World Health Organization. The attack on our female sex-based rights in the name of gender identity, LGBT equality, and trans rights must be understood as part of a strategic orchestrated campaign financed and managed by the world's most powerful institutions. Women say no to our dehumanization and erasure. We will not be silent. Nothing, nothing will stop us from protecting children from the psychological and physical harms of the law that is gender identity. While working at an LGBT nonprofit, I was paid in part by New York State to indoctrinate public school children with gender identity and transgender ideology. I have since become a whistleblower, working to document, expose, and publicly speak out about the attack on children being coordinated to the collusion of the state, corporate, and private sectors who use seemingly benevolent nonprofit organizations to push propaganda and target children to the public school system. We have come together to say enough. Enough! 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 Keep your puberty blockers out of the arms of children they cannot consent. Keep your wrong sex hormones out of the bodies of children they cannot consent. Keep your experimental medicine away from children they cannot consent. Children cannot consent! Children cannot consent! So 20 days after this first ever protest for uh, a women's demonstration against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Human Rights YouTube uploaded a video titled UN Free and Equal Stand in Solidarity with All Women. The video, published April 5th, again, 20 days after our protest, asks, quote, what does it mean to be a woman before going on to state, quote, I am a woman and I am trans. Simply by existing as I am, I am taking a stand against prejudice and discrimination that I am faced with every day. All LGBTIQ plus women are women with our own distinct identities and struggles, but united in our common fight for justice and equality. The video ends by saying, what does it mean to be a woman? No one gets to decide for us. <laughs> in July 2022, the World Health Organization announced that sex shall no longer be limited to male or female. In a statement, the WHO announced they would be updating their widely used gender mainstreaming manual. The World Health Organization claims that they will be, quote, going beyond non-binary approaches to gender and health to recognize gender and sexual diversity or the concepts that gender identity exists on a continuum and that sex is not limited to male or female. 
On December 16th, 2022, the Twitter account for the UN Special Procedures tweeted, quote, UN IE SOGI expert Victor Madrigal urges Scottish government to complete its deliberations and adopt the gender recognition reform bill. A photo shared with the tweet and attributed to Madrigal says in reference to men, quote, trans women are among the most vilified, disenfranchised, stigmatized people on this planet. On December 22nd, 2022, the Scottish government passed the GRA bill, which is a plan to allow anyone over the age of 16 born or living in Scotland to change their sex in law in as little as six months and without the need for diagnosis or medical intervention. The, uh, sorry, medical evidence. The Scottish government is now putting pressure on the UK government to recognize the legal, legal status of Scottish self-ID across the whole of the UK. Little clip of us in front of the United Nations. In conclusion, the United Nations Sustainability Goals are presented to us as utopian ideals that will save the world. In reality, the UN and their many collaborators are utilizing existing corporate and financial power structures to fuel the erasure of the sex-based rights and realities of females worldwide under the cover of LGBT inclusion while simultaneously investing in biopharmaceutical and reproductive technologies that will usurp female reproductive autonomy and sovereignty. We will never comply with the lies of transgender ideology. Men are not women. Uh, men will never become women. Join me in saying no to the spread of gender identity laws and policies that erase sex-based protections of females and saying yes to the call for courage to stand up in the unapologetic defense of women and girls everywhere. We will hold the line for humanity. We will not allow the future they want to build to come to pass, and we will only grow in our understanding and in our numbers. Women will not comply, women do not consent, and we are just getting started building our global resistance, just as they are building um, a, a globalized agenda against us. We women are uniting across country, around the world, to raise our voices and speak out. So thank you to WDI for holding these webinars so that we can continue to connect, come together, organize, strengthen our analysis and our voices. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from Linda Blade, who's from Canada. She's going to talk about the launch of the International Consortium on Female Sport. But Dr. Linda Blade is a former NCAA All-American and National Champion of Canada in track and field, heptathlon. She's got a PhD in kinesiology. For the past, past 26 years, has run a private consulting business as sport performance professional coach in Edmonton, Alberta, working, working with athletes in over 15 sports, beginner level to elite. In 2014, Linda was elected to president of the board for Athletics Alberta, where she has a duty to represent the province of Alberta at Canadian national sport policy meetings. To amplify her lobbying efforts on behalf of the female athletes, Linda partnered with journalist Barbara Kay in 2021 to author best-selling book titled Unsporting, How Trans Activism and Science Denial Are Destroying Sport. Linda is happy to report that two months ago she became coordinator of WDI Canada, and I'm happy as well as part of WDI that to, to have her involved. Um, Today, she'll reveal to us the next stage in the global journey to protect the female sports category. So thank you so much, Linda, for coming on and over to you. I'm just here to talk a lot about an exciting, uh, really, a, I think it would be, I can say, groundbreaking initiative. Um, so we all know, and it's pretty obvious by now, most of us know 
that there's a growing number of men self-identifying into women's sports. And when I was became aware of it, it was around 2018, you know, was the Rachel McKinnon, the Connecticut boys running in the girls high school track. Uh, there was like Callum Fox. Then we understood back in even as early as 2014, knocking uh, Tamika Brent out in the in the ring when she didn't know she was fighting a male. And, and, you know, now there's so many more, like there's so many more, there's men identifying into women's uh, skateboarding, rowing, rugby, surfing, and many, many more. And of course we had Leah Thomas in the spring of 2022, winning the NCAA women's swimming outrageous. Um, and if I circle back to Tokyo Olympics in 2021, we had Laurel Hubbard, taking the place of Roviel de Tenamo of Nauru. So Laurel Hubbard, a male athlete in weightlifting, took the place of a young woman uh, who would never, had never made it to the Olympic Games because Laurel Hubbard was there. And, and uh, so, you know, uh, it, you know, one of the things, so when I became, when I came into this, this movement and, and understood what was going on and started fighting back, my assumption, I made a major assumption that turned out to be false. The, the assumption I made was that if sports officials, if it's finally seen what's going on, if somebody goes into the Olympics and it's a man and, and everybody sees what's going on, um, sports officials will quickly fix. They'll be so ashamed and they'll quickly fix the issue and, and fix the policy. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, it seems like the opposite has happened. It seems like leaders are trying even harder to just ram this policy through that those of us in women's sports, we just need to be kind, we need to be a, a acknowledging. And, and an example of, of this in Canada, Canada is very captured as you all know, but in the spring of this past year, 2022, um, you know, we've been saying that Canadian women in sport, we never were consulted. And um, so quietly, Sport Canada started, it launched a, um, quietly survey a survey targeting high performance Canadian female athletes on their views on inclusion and one trans activist found out about this and they sent a heads up to the American trans ally um, I think it's uh, athletes alley which is a trans activist organization by now and athletes alley quickly arranged a petition where 200 signatures or something mostly American some Canadian and the trans um, and athletes alley actually got wrote and shamed the Canadian Minister of Sport into shutting down the survey of Canadian female athletes. So imagine a, 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 a trans activist group from a different country got our Canadian Minister, uh, our Canadian Ministry of Sport, to stop a survey of uh, the high performance female athletes. So they don't want our voices. They don't. They are trying everything they can to stop our voices. And then, you know, obviously that's not kind. So um, let's talk about then back in, you know, one of the things about the assumption of that IOC and, and all these International Olympic Committee would have to react to Laurel Hubbard. Well, they did. They did admit that the policy from 2015 allowing men to self ID into women's sports without any surgery, that had to be, you know, somehow it was not fit for purpose. Something had to be adapted, adjusted. And they resumed some consultations on eligibility in women's sports in August of 2021. And we noticed on Twitter, those of us involved in women's sports, we noticed they were once again only consulting trans activists. Trans activists like Rachel McKinnon were, were you know, basically bragging that they were being asked to go to Lausanne and talk to, at the table with the IOC. And of course, women once again, we're not being consulted. And so the great Catherine Deves from Australia, who's a lawyer, sent a letter uh, saying, well, why don't you, can we have women at the table? Can, can we, are women allowed to be consulted? Can we have women being consulted about this? And we did surprisingly, because normally the IOC doesn't even pay attention to us, but IOC did respond quite quickly. And by September, 2021, the IOC said, nope, uh, consultations are closed. We've already talked to people like you, basically, like dismissing the women. And so um, it was a rejection and it got even worse because then when the IOC announced its position at the end of 2021, a new revised policy, it was even worse than the one before. Because basically then they said it was up to each sport 
uh, of course, you know, okay, it can be up to each sport to find their, their own eligibility guidelines. But the basic fundamental principle that was established in November of 2021 by the IOC was that from now on, it would be up to the female athlete to prove disproportionate competitive advantage if there was a man in her race. Like, what in the world? Like, a, a girl's just running a race. Is she supposed to end the race and just prove disproportionate competitive advantage in that moment? Like, how does that even happen? So anyway, what we did is we considered this, I personally uh, and a number of others, consider this to be a betrayal. So in what way was it a betrayal? Well, back 100 years ago in 2022, I'm going to show you a video right now. So this was the first women's uh, Olympiad, <laughs> women only. We had our own sport and we, this is in Monaco, and we were actually drawing crowds of people. We were filling stadiums to watch women only sport. This was the first one. And then later there was more people in the stadiums. Um, and it really, really made an impact. I'm going to let you watch a little bit of it and I'll keep talking. You just keep on trying till you run out of cake. And the science gets done and you make a This was 1922. All right, so that's the end. So basically, we had our own Olympics going, and the men didn't like it that we were calling it the Olympic Games for Women. And so there was this um, there was this decision by 1928 uh, to amalgamate and to bring the women's track and field into the Olympics. And so um, what we did at that point was essentially then allow. Uh, our sports, women's sports, to be run, you know, obviously by the men's Olympics. And, and, and ever since then, everything we wanted to do in the Olympic Games, we kind of had to have the approval of the males running the Olympic program. And we did make progress. I'm not going to say we didn't. I mean, but it took, you know, for example, the women's marathon, it took 84 years for the men to allow women to run a marathon. So everything we did within the Olympic movement always had to be with petitions and asking for favors and asking for parity and asking for like that we would have the same number of events and opportunities as the men. And so we successfully, well, we did that, but it was still uh, mostly up to male, you know, male leaders and to allow us. So basically we've had a hundred years experiment experiment where, where we basically conceded the control of our sport to men's organizations and 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 again like with the NCAA and everything like it seemed to work well well but now with with now when men start coming into our sport and want to self identify into our sport basically really it's up to these guys to make that decision and we really are helpless and so we don't want to be helpless we want to say the 100 years experiment of just conceding our power to those organizations to run our sports Maybe that that's a hundred years experiment that sort of worked, but maybe we can improve and do better. In 2022, after realizing that the IOC was never going to listen to us, wasn't going to really uh, concede or give us any kind of uh, you know seat at the table, we had a bunch of women and all the groups around the world who are um, specifically dealing with the women's rights and women's sports like Fair Play for Women in the UK and Save Women's Sports USA and Cosbar in Canada, a lot of us decided to just com come together and start meeting and maybe form a new global partnership of women uh, advocating for other women in sport. And we are calling this the International Consortium 
on female sport. Uh, and we just finished in this last, uh, about a month ago, finishing this logo. I, I, we're, we're quite proud of it. A man named Gord in Calgary helped us uh, develop this. He's a designer. But you can see the two X's for biology in our logo. You can see the, so the celebrating woman or a celebrating person. And you can even see the W for women in there. So it's a nice logo and we really, really like it. Um, but we really, the whole point of it is to collectively represent the female voice in sport. And, and please take note of this link. This is the link to our new website. Um, and it's really important that we're going to spread the word about this link because I'll, I'll explain why. I just want to reinforce the fact that what we're doing is actually um, absolutely in line with the WDI, especially Article 7, and we're, we're completely 100% um, in favor of obviously supporting and affirming sex-based rights of women in sports. And, and further to Article 7, let's read it aloud. Article 7, reaffirming, reaffirming women's rights to the same opportunities as men to participate actively in sport and physical education. The founding principle of the ICFS is fairness and safety for female athletes in sport is ensured by having a dedicated category for those born female. What does this mean? Really, uh, what we're saying is when it comes to sports, like I have to be involved in this in Canada, it, 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 there should be a category, a female category, and whatever y'all else you want to do, if there's trans people and you want to put them somewhere else, that's a different issue. But there has to be one category in sport dedicated to the female athlete. That's what we're saying. And all members of this group agree with the following three statements. Sex equality matters in all aspects of life, including in sport. In accordance with the tenets of the International Bill of Human Rights, the intent of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, Article 10G, and the precepts of the Women's Declaration, Article 7, women and girls have a right to access and participate in sports in a manner that is fair, safe, and without discrimination. To be denied this right is discrimination on the basis of sex. Statement two, it is the consortium's position that policy discussion on eligibility in women's sports pertaining to any level, community, regional, national, and international, and or involving any jurisdiction must involve women who advocate for or who work or participate in female, female sport, including meaningful consultation with female athletes in question. And finally, the statement number three, the ICFS is a nonpartisan single issue collective of, collective of women's sports advocates. That means that membership or partnership with the ICFS in no way indicates political affiliation with fellow members regarding any other topic. This is simply and specifically about sport. We welcome all voices who are going to protect females in sport. So the purpose, the purpose of the ICFS is to serve as the key international lobby group uh, to advocate for the preservation of the female sport category. What does this mean so that we can be involved in sports negotiations at the highest level to the regional level? In other words, the 100 year experiment is over. We need to start taking control and responsibility for women's sports as well. To hold, we want to hold sports accountable, and we we want to congratulate those sports who get the policy right. We want to raise awareness of unfairness and safe and unsafety with female sports whenever it's going on, and to, and we want to be a place where girls and women can go for help. Um, we want, for example, even this next week, once we uh, get going, we're writing letters on behalf of a female weightlifter. Uh, there's people now already starting to come to us for, for assistance. Monday, January 9th is a huge day. This is the global launch of the ICFS. There will be a press release being sent out to 5,000 news outlets around the world that we exist, that we're here. Um, and the simple message is women around the world are assembling to take our sports back. We're gonna take our control back at least to the extent that we have global representation these are posters. So you get ready, you're going to start seeing posters like these going out. And, you know, if you don't mind, just retweet, retweet them, share them on social media. 
Um, this is our chance to get the word out to all the women and girls, even the, in remote areas that, that we do um, want to be there. The chance for us to, to win and to get our sports back uh, they, they need to understand we're speaking on their behalf because, you know, I've even mentioned it. There was some figure skaters yesterday I was talking to and they don't want to say anything when, when, when their sport association given away their sport, but if they know we exist, they have, it encourages them to speak up and say something really. It's especially important that young girls and their supporters all around the world visit the site and, it, and link and and just like the declaration sign their sign the form that says they agree with us it's important that we have numbers um the the more numbers that we have the more validity will be our claim that we are the largest sport advocacy group for women and girls globally and you know here's the here's a part of the website that shows uh you know it, it'll scroll so this is only one small portion it shows the collection the core group of sports uh or core collection of sports groups here's the list of the core groups that got together um canadian women's sex based rights cause bar from canada um la rueda uh, rosa cycling group from mexico save women's sports australasia alianza contra el borrado de las mujeres in spain Save Women's Sports Spain, Fair Play for Women UK, um, Sex Matters ad Advisory Group, uh, um, and that's the one with Emma Hilton and, and um, Kathy Devine, and Champion Women USA, Icons Independent Council, Icons, the Independent Council on Women's Sports USA, Save Women's Sports USA, Women's Sport Policy Group. So there's, there's we have now about um, groups from 10 countries, um all working together already our goal is to uh, we are inspired by the wdi to get 150 countries like you have uh I, we have uh, in the wdi it's really really important that when you get to the website that you click as a affiliate member you won't be the core member if you're not directly involved in sports but if you agree with our statement of position please go and sign and the more numbers again the more numbers you can be an affiliate group as a group like as an organization you can be affiliate as an organization group or you can be an individual affiliate just as a person and that's for the young girl athletes who want to just come onto our page and say yeah i agree with you i want emails i want to be in touch um so it, it again the legitimacy is the numbers it's really important that we have numbers that we can tell you know, the IOC at some point, like we have 100,000 women that are we represent because one of the biggest problems was if you go back to 2021, when the IOC refused to consult with women, there is a legitimate question as who does represent the women's woman's voice. Like when when if it would have been me at the time in 2021, that would be invited to Lausanne, Switzerland to, to meet at the table at the Olympic Committee. Well, who's Linda Blade? I mean, who do I represent? There is the question when, when it's 50% of the world's population, who does represent that voice? There's a lot of, as we know, uh, you know, intersectional feminists who would actually argue the opposite position as us, as you've seen on, on Kay Yang's presentation. So the more numbers we have, the more we can say, we are the voice for the female athlete and we deserve a place at the table and we will continue to advocate and we will not take, take the, the, uh, erasure of our sport sitting down we will fight back and reclaim the control please join us and thank you for this opportunity and now we're going to go to our next speaker who's anna hidalgo from spain she's going to talk to us about gender identity ideology and girls from schools to hormones she anna is the president of the feminist teachers and professors organization dofemco and co-author with other with three other members of the organization of a book on the impact of transgender ideology identity ideology in spanish schools so thank you so much anna for talking to us and over to you i would like to say that um dofenco as joe already said um, is made up on um, is made up of teachers and professors we are all women we are radical feminists and we are teachers from um, nursery school to uh, university and we were really worried three years ago um, and we decided to start the to, to set the association up 
what we were seeing um, were lots of trans activists um, inside our classrooms since 2014, um, telling this crazy and anti-scientific, anti-progressist, anti-feminist ideas that uh, you can be born in the wrong body, that being a woman is uh, just a feeling, that the sex is an spectrum, that uh, sex, um, um, that your sex um, um, uh, feelings uh, towards another person were similar to your uh, sexual identity. So we were um, really worried about the results we were seeing in our students um, because they were already um, uh, transitioning, uh, most of them girls, as Silvia Carrasco will also uh, show you. And we, we wanted to do something, we wanted to take action. The first big action we, we had was a press conference in 2021, 20, uh, in February, uh, in which we showed all those ideas, how they were entering in, in the schools. Uh, it was a really big success. We were also uh, supported by Movimiento, uh, the Confluencia del Movimiento Feminista, that is the big platform in which all um, the associations, the radical feminist associations are in. And it was a big success. There were many uh, journalists. However, we didn't reach the public. You know that there is a lot of silence. So um, we know that they, many journalists know what is happening, that at least is um, something, but we, we, we couldn't reach to the public. The second big action we had was in November uh, 2021, for three days, we had um, um, a congress, an international congress, in which uh, along three days we talk about uh, professors at the university telling what were, what were um, what they were seeing. Um, in fact, today um, on the chat I have seen uh, Kathleen Lorry, that was one of uh, uh, the, the, the professors talking, Juana Gallego, that is also there from Barcelona. Um, we have three main conferences from a professor, Silvia Carrasco, uh, from a teacher from secondary school that was on, on, my, on my behalf. And another one um, from Alicia eh, Boluda, that is one teacher in, in Dofenco that talked about what was happening in families and, and in, in kids in the schools. No? Uh, uh, in total, we had uh, 44 testimonies that were really, really hard to listen to, really hard. Um, how teachers are uh, persecuted, how uh, students are transitioning, how girls don't feel comfortable in toilets, you know, all this um, that is going on inside. So it is in, in YouTube, in our uh, channel, in Dofemco, and you can see it with subtitles in English. And we have um, testimonies from all over the world, uh, from Brazil, Canada, um, Sweden, uh, the UK, um Mexico, Argentina, I mean, we try to have to, to like to gather as many testimonies to, to see that this is international and it is happening everywhere. No? Uh, then uh, last December on, on the 16th, uh, Dofenco also went to the Congress in Spain. You know that uh, they have uh, the Congress has passed the trans law that is going to be like the umbrella for the, the rest 44 laws we, we have already functioning here in Spain. And even if we couldn't talk in the plenary session, we were not allowed, we weren't allowed. Uh, we had a room in which we had an experts conference, so to say, where politicians could, could go and be there and have some um, some ideas about what, what is the reality, no? what is really happening. And I think it was also a big success because even if we couldn't go to the plenary session, at least uh, we could um, have our, you know, the, the right to be there in a democracy. We have the right to go to the Congress to, to talk and there we were. So uh, with all this information, uh, we were able to, to release last uh, November the 3rd, our book that is called Coeducation Hijacked. Uh, and the subtitle is Feminist Critique of the Penetration of Transgender Ideas in Education. 
Uh, the, prologue, uh, the prologue writer is uh, Gemma Lienas, that is um, a, fe a radical feminist um, a woman, uh, is also a politician who has as the main aim uh, girls and women's rights. And she was the one that put us in contact with Octaedro, the, the um, a publishing house. Um, that released the book and Octaedro, let me tell you, now that we are here, <laughs> la, that it's the, is number one, it's, it's the publishing house is number one in education and it also publishes in, it has connections with other publishing houses in English, so we hope that being here 300 uh, women uh, is like a way to show that there is a lot of interest uh, having the book uh, translated into English. Um, about the authors, I also have to say that even if we are four authors uh, from Dofenko, um, all the um, all the document, the, all the data, uh, the, the research, all our experience is not from the four authors. is for is about all the experience and the the, the supply of uh, do documentary data from all the teachers in Dofenko. Uh, many of them, they cannot put their names, so the ones who gather all the information were uh, uh, we four, but it is the work of many, many more teachers. About the title, um, it's, a, it's a pity, but uh, well, you know that um, once uh, students could study together, uh, mix education, um, we first we call that a, a co-education, but once the students uh, were in, in the rooms together, in the classrooms together, in, at least in Spain, there was a shift, a turn uh, of the term, and we call it co-education to the feminist agenda uh, that um, has co-education as the pedagogical uh, key, the pedagogical resource to um, eradicate uh, sexism, androcentrism in the curriculum, uh, sexual stereotypes, and violence of, on women in schools, okay? So when we talk about co-education, we are talking about the feminist agenda to eradicate uh, patriarchy. The problem was that it had a very good reputation um, and it has been like emptied of its meaning by transactivists. So now everything that transactivists are included in schools, they call it co-education. And that's a big problem because we have these transgender ideas at the same time as co-education has is suffering like a big uh, backlash, you know, a big reaction. So it's, dif it's difficult uh, because they are colliding, so to say. That's why the title is that one. Um, our main aim was, um, first of all, to denounce and to put all our knowledge, uh, uh, all our knowledge on paper. So to make that denounce, but um, to try to inform not only gender critical parents that were really um, wanting our book to be published, uh, but not only parents and, and teachers and professors that are like the target, um, um, the target readers, but also so society in general and also politicians. Okay, also politicians. So uh, the reception is is being. I mean, we are really really happy. It is selling um, smoothly. But uh, it's true that if you go to a library, any, li any library or bookshop here in Spain, you have to wait 10, 15 days because they tell you that the book is not on the shelves. So they don't want to uh, be boycotted, we understand. So they are, at the, at that, so, uh, they are boycotting the book. So uh, we have a big problem with bookshops here in Spain because they, they don't want to have our, our book on the shelves. But uh, we know that it is selling, and even in, in Amazon, we see lots of really good uh, remarks and commentaries, and well, that's the reception. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the chapters. So the first one uh, talks about what I told you about co-education, how it has been like empty, but giving like a very, very broad idea, because we imagine that 
Um, the problem with a gender critical parent is that they, 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 they are going to know what is going on in the schools, but first they need to have like what we already have as a radical feminists, that is the, the, the big picture, no? the, to see all the, pro the problem in all its dimension. So the first chapter uh, talks about how neoliberalism is fighting against all movements, trying to dissolve uh, all movements. And I would say that the last bastion of uh, social movements is feminism. So as the neo neoliberal aim is uh, to, to make the market of life a legitimate one, as all the feminists already know with, with many other topics, uh, now, uh, we know that with the big pharma and the medical biotechnological, you know, uh, uh, um, firms, uh, they are also uh, like uh, arm in arm with the transhuman agenda that, that is like the, the big um, ideology behind, as Sheila Jeffries already said in 2014. And uh, they are also arm in arm with the rich corporations that uh, Jennifer Billick and many, many other uh, women already know. Uh, also, uh, Kay Jang also shows us uh, some of these uh, big corporations. Uh, they are the ones that are governing, governing in the shadow. No? So at the end, what they are pursuing is the dissolution of feminism and its pedagogical tool that, as I told you, is co-education. No? So uh, chapter number two is about the, how this uh, gender identity ideology is propagating uh, through or by mass and social media. So we have tried to, to put all, all the documentaries, films, series, um, cartoons, you know, Disney is one of those rich corporations behind, no? So we have tried to, to, to make the reader uh, conscious of how this uh, propaganda is, is being vehicle so that as we spend lots of times um, with our screens on, on our faces, so to say, that is the best way no? to get to every uh, individual. Now chapter three and chapter four are um, when I was here in August 2021, my everything I explained to you and also Silvia Carrasco that was uh, a year before I was uh, here, um, we were talking about chapters three and four. So this time what we have done is to put all that information in on, on paper. No? Uh, chapter three is about the penetration of gender identity ideology in education through laws. And that started in 2014. In Spain, we have 17 communities, no, 17 communities, autonomous communities, and um, two autonomous cities. And there are um, 15 laws in so each autonomy, so to say, almost each of, of them has a trans law. As well, we have trans protocols in education so that teachers learn. Uh, how to make all the transition, no? all the social transition. So in chapter three, we have all these protocols studied uh, thoroughly. So it, it's, it's amazing the, the way it, it is presented because you can see that it is an international agenda, but also if you compare each of the protocols in Spain in the different regions, they are the same, no? they, they say the same. Even if the politicians who have passed them uh, or presented the protocols to be passed, were from the, um, the, the, the right, the left, nationalists, whatever, it doesn't really matter, no? And then in, we also make a, a, a we also uh, try to show how this legislation collides with the international legislation that uh, protects girls and women. And all the, the, the educative laws that protect or should protect uh, women and girls um, that are now like um, water paper. I mean, they mean nothing if we have these gender identity laws. In chapter four, we see how the protocols tell us in the schools, uh, which is the adaptation, no? how we have to adapt uh, the, center, the centers in the curriculum. We already have the gingerbread, for example, is already in books. Uh, all the contents have to be trans inclusive. 
uh, the toilets are mixed in most, most schools, and how teachers, we are being um, instruments, just mere instruments, to, to try to identify and create no? new, new trans kids. Uh, we have to um, accompany them and to adapt the center so that the students feel, feel comfortable. And if you don't do it, you are going to be, well, you know, uh, or silenced, or you can even lose your, your job. No? As we, we saw in the International Congress uh, in 2021, we had uh, a teacher from Sweden that lost her job because she didn't want to call they to students individually. Instead of he or she, uh, the school uh, protocol wanted her to say that and she said no, so she lost her job. And we also had uh, two teachers from, from the United States who also lost her jo their, their jobs because they, they didn't want mixed toilets in the school and, and they were complaining, so they, they lost her job, their, their job, sorry. Uh, chapter five um, is about the impact of gender identity ideology on students and the way all these uh, transgender ideas uh, penetrate in, in students uh, in schools and how students are inducted to be trans and captured by a sect because they are like, they are a sect, no, a cult. So here you have one of the, um, of the photos of the images we have in the book in which we can see the spectrum. So I would like to, I would like you to think that you are uh, 12, 13, that you are there in the school and, and how the process uh, works. No? Here you can see it in the blue circles. So first of all, uh, they are going to tell you know, that there is like a big spectrum. So they are going to dissociate you, your, your brain. They are going to dissociate you um, from your body and they are going to tell you, no, this is the spectrum and you can discover in which place you are. No? So there is no binarity. Uh, so where look and search where you are, and then uh, you are going to feel that you are going to make a transgression. No, you you don't really you are not really male or female. And then the last step uh, is the awareness of the of the oppression. No, now you are going to be in the group that is the most oppressed ever group in in society. So uh, we also include in the chapter how um, these transgender activists don't talk at all about detransitioners and they don't talk at all about hormones and uh, blockers and, and the harm, no? all the harm they are doing uh, to, to our kids. In chapter six, we wanted to talk as well parents, uh, gender critical parents, no? so showing the impact of gender identity ideology and the protocols on families. So um, as we understand it, there are two options. If you are a, a mother or a father and the school, the, the counselor tells you that you have a trans kid, no? uh, you can, I mean, if you don't know about about anything of trans activism, you, you will receive a leaflet, no? a brochure about a trans activist uh, family group or association. And there you are going to be captured, converted, and most of these uh, families spread these ideas in the schools. They become trans activists. No? And the other option, if you have doubts or if you directly say no, um, well, you can, the school can open, uh, um, can, can think, that, I mean, can, they can tell you that you can go to jail directly. Uh, we have some cases and we open the chapter talking about one, one person that is already in jail in the USA. And the problem is that if you are gender critical, you as a, as a father or a mother, you have to know that there is a, um, trans family that is going to uh, substitute you in social media. So they are going to try to steal your kid. No? So we thought that it was important as well to, 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 to show that. 
And we finished the chapter talking about uh, gender critical families associations, for example, partners for ethical care that I saw uh, Janet Cooper in Key, in Key Jan's uh, presentation in the video. She was also one of the testimonies we had in the, in the Congress last year. And we also talked in the book about Amanda, that is the Spanish uh, the Gender Critical uh, Parents Association. So the last chapter, um, we try to do something similar to what we did in chapter one, no? try to show the, the, the picture in all its dimension. That is showing the consequences and the reactions in the international framework. No? How feminists have been uh, persecuted uh, in many, many countries, uh, how teachers have been per uh, also uh, persecuted, uh, how the trans um, are joining together and they are the, like, the most important voice. Uh, we think that's the voice that our students can, can, can listen to, no? because they are, they are young and they, they talk out of experience. We also talk about uh, the different uh, educative associations uh, internationally, like Safe School Alliance or Transgender Trend and some others. Even if uh, DOFENCO is the only uh, educative association uh, just of teachers, it's the only one uh, that is made up of uh, teachers. Um, and we finish the chapter in a positive way, uh, talking about how different countries are reversing measures, no? like England, Sweden, uh, Finland, and even Holland, I read yesterday, no? the, the Dutch protocol, this affirmative protocol. Um, there is a, a study that says that it was uh, paid by, a, uh, by the big pharma. No? What a surprise. And then in the conclusion, and in, we have also an appendix in which we make a synthesis um, to give a guidance, to, be, to give guidance to teachers and families, because in Dofenko, we receive emails uh, every week, some different emails, but they usually ask the same questions. No? What can I do as a teacher if, if I have a trans student? Uh, what can I do as a, uh, as a mother no? if my teacher say, if, if my student, sorry. If my kid says that uh, that is trans, so different questions that we wanted to to give response to. And just the last thing I wanted to say about the book is that we dedicate the book to all the teachers in Dofenko, because they are the ones that are fighting in school your working posts. That is something really difficult, really really difficult. But we are also um, going to any demonstration or anywhere where we can, and we will continue like that. So the book is not only for, uh, uh, for students, uh, for parents, but it's especially for the teachers in Dofenco. Thank you. Sylvia Carrasco Pons is the president of the feminist organization Femin Feminists of Catalonia, who have realized very recently a report or created a report on the transition services in the region, showing the global trend of the tremendous increase of transition of young girls. And she's going to talk to keep us up to date with that and talk about the book that's just been published. So welcome back, Sylvia, and it's lovely to see you and over to you. This is in fact, a second part that uh, is um, logically coming after my colleague Anna's uh, brief talk, because it shows the impact of within the same uh, framework, gender identity ideology and girls from schools to hormones. Now, we've seen what happens in schools, now we're going, going to see what happens when they are referred to health services specialized in what they call gender identity services, etc. Which is, in fact, another example of something you've uh, lived and through uh, and seen through your own countries in, in many, many countries, especially in the UK recently, uh, luckily. So it's another example of how the global agenda of the male eraser that started the talk today works at the local level. So again, another issue. And, and we're proposing to talk about girls and to ask the society and the politicians and also feminist organization to work for girls and to ask the question about girls, which is forbidden by uh, transgenderism. They don't want us to ask the question. So as uh, many other colleagues were from whom we've learned a lot say trans childhood does not exist, but it is being manufactured internationally on behalf of a profound 
and well-financed authoritarian political movement to allow the expansion of neoliberal capitalism for which women and children are the first targets as commodities. No matter how often we repeat it, it's truth. It must be said all the time, everywhere, in every country and occasion. And recently we had the opportunity to say it in the, in the Congreso de los Diputados in, in Spain, and we'll talk about it at any, any occasion that's been given to us. And girls within all these are the first and foremost victims of this manufacturing. And of course, I need to start by saying that I'm very, very grateful for the invitation to present here at the weekly webinar, uh, Feminist Question Time uh, of Women's Declaration International. And special thanks go for Amparo Domingo, uh, my colleague and friend, Joe Brew, of course, Linda Kay and Anna, best ever companions in this, in this session today, and all the other comrades here. So this is the, I'm going to present the results of a unique research to date, but wait, because there will come others soon, on the impact of a trans law, a regional trans law, the regional trans law in Catalonia passed in October 2014, which resulted in the corresponding educational and health protocols to develop its articles. Like all legislation based on transgender ideology or gender identity ideology, um, this law advocates the so-called affirmative model of treatment of gender dysphoria, which is based on the self-diagnosis of the person, no matter how old she is, in the belief that she can be born in the wrong body and the consequent treatment to adapt her body to what in the person's terms is called the gender identity feeling. You can see this is uh, the post where we, where you can find the documents in Catalan and Spanish uh, of the report from adult men to adolescent girls, changes, trends, and questions about referrals to survey transit, which can be trans translated the equivalent of the gender identity or the gender development service that was uh, located at Tavista Porman or any equivalent in other countries, okay? So we decided to carry out this research because there were no accessible and open data about the number of people in the process of medical transitions, but all our indicators um, and feelings, in fact, if we're talking about feelings, were telling us that uh, there was an increase, an increase was taking place, especially among adolescent girls, especially carrying out research in schools as we had been doing for the previous uh, three years. And the result of which is the book that Anna uh, recently summarized for you. This research has been carried out by an interdisciplinary, in this interdisciplinary independent team of researchers from the organization uh, Feministas de Catalunya, not in a, in a research group at the university, although I'm a professor at the university, and nor, of course, by the authorities who should be the ones to be doing this kind of research to, sh to, to check the impact of the policies and the treatments they apply. No, it's been done by us. Some of the researchers need to remain anonymous for security reasons to avoid problems at work or in their careers. And this is also very important to mention. It has been based on data provided by the Department of Health, which was very difficult to acquire of the regional government, the Generalitat de Catalunya, on the cases treated by the survey transit, as I said, the equivalent of the Gender Identity Development Service in the UK, between 2012, the year in which it began to operate, and 2021, the last year for which there are data. Although now they will have collected data for 2022, which of course we're going to ask for. Although the data is not complete and presents some incoherences and have not been provided with the level of disaggregation requested, we have reconstructed the evolution uh, of the number of cases and trends by age, sex, and type of intervention or treatment, psychological consultation, hormone prescription, or cross-sex hormone prescription, or surgery where possible. The report is available in Catalan and Spanish, and as I said, on our website, hopefully we're going to translate. In fact, we have already translated part of it, just a briefing and a one-pager in English. We're going to publish and, and upload it on, on our website soon. And it has been sent, the full report and the one-pager and the summary, to all the members of the regional parliament of Catalonia and uh, the low and high chambers in the country in recent weeks, because they are now discussing uh, whether they, they definitely pass the bill on the, the, the state trans law or not. We have uh, at, uh, currently 15 
trans laws, uh, regional trans laws in, uh, in the country that do not allow for self-ID in census. They do allow for it in many other aspects of life. So we know what was happening in the countries around us in September 2018. The then UK Equality Minister, I believe, Peggy Mordaunt, alarmed by the 4,400% increase in girls seeking transitional treatment in less than a decade, stuck with this figure, commissioned an independent inquiry, or at least this is the, the, the narrative, that had resulted in the CAS report made public in spring 2022 from whose conclusions of the gender identity unit of the Travis Performance Clinic that served the minor population is closed and the model of care is being transformed, uh, deeply revised. So among other things that are well known for all of you, they observe that there is no reliable record of evalu or evaluation of the results obtained with the treatment applied, which lack medical consensus and whose protocols have been denounced by its own staff and uh, without a priority psychological approach uh, based on the key questions that I was saying that must be asked. First, what happens to these girls and why? And second, why is there an older representation of children and youth with psychosocial vulnerabilities among those requesting for gender transitions? In addition, in December 2020, the young Kira Bell won the trial for medical negligence against the Tavistock Portman Clinic for having been induced to cross hormone and irreversible surgeries as underage, as uh, is happening right now in Spain. And uh, we hope there is uh, our own Kirabel soon. And now there are more than a thousand families in, in the UK, I believe, who have filed complaints again against the Tavistock Portland Clinic and its methods. In Sweden in 2021, the Karolinska Hospital, the reference hospital for treating gender dys dysphoria, decreed the end of treatments for children and underage youngsters with poverty blockers and cross-sex hormones after a longitudinal study with data showing that their mental health does not improve with treatment and instead they do cause serious injuries. injuries. Since then, they have opted for a psychological and ethical approach to the anguish of children and youth who reject their bodies. And this is the literal formulation they use. In Finland, since 2020, based on studies with similar results of care services for children and youth with gender dysphoria, they decide to apply even more drastic measures, distancing themselves from the standards set by the World Association of Transgender Health Professionals, WPATH, uh, choosing psychotherapy over any hormonal treatment or surgery for those under 25. The title of the study, as I said, is From Adult Men to Adolescent Girls, Changes, Trends and Questions about Referrals to Transit in Catalonia. Well, what is the situation in Catalonia? The total volume of cases is over uh, 5,500 people with an exponential increase of more than 7,000%. I have to say that the population in Catalonia is uh, 7.5 million people. New annual cases have quadrupled between 2016 and the year 2021 alone. And the year 2021 alone already accounts for 25% of the cases, you can see the rise, of the 10 years analyzed, revealing the impact of COVID-19 related confinement and increased exposure to social networks, especially among children and youth. The average age has fallen 12 years from 2012 to 2021, from 34 to, 20 years, uh, to 22 years on average. The transit service, the gender identity unit, serves more and more women and more and more minors with clearly differentiated age pattern between women and men that reveals very different situations. You can see it here. We call it the fish graph. Uh, among children from zero to nine, Men, boys predominate in the age group between 10 and 14 and 15 to 25, girls predominate. And in the age group over 30 years, men again predominate, where there are, they are more than 70% of the cases. There is therefore an accelerated change in the demographic pattern of the, populate, the population served from men to women, 
from adults to minors. The majority of cases of underage children are girls. The majority of cases of adults are men. The increase is alarming among pre-adolescent and adolescent girls. 70% of cases in the 10 to 14 and 15 to 18 age, group, age groups are women. Although the increase is also alarming in the case of boys, only between 2015 and 2021, there has been an increase of 5,700% of girls aged 10 to 14 years of age among the cases treated by the service, by this unit. Therefore, this increase is much higher than the figure that caused the first alarm in the UK in 2018 and started the independent report that has finally resulted into the CAS report published in 2022. We expect for that. We expect to have that impact. There is an equally alarming percentage of cases in which the sex of the persons treated is not recorded, reaching more than 10% in these same age groups. From the trends observed and the triangulation with data from other partial sources, which speak of non-binary girls, whatever that means, we know they are girls, it can be inferred that these cases where uh, sex is not recorded are girls. In relation to treatment, we know that most cases receive hormonal treatment. In fact, in a 2016 report by the service itself, the unit itself acknowledged that in 80% of cases, the prescription of hormones is provided on the first visit, regardless of age a fact that is being corroborated by our qualitative research on cases of children and adolescents. All this makes us believe that our estimates are conservative. Reality is much worse. For example, we do not have any data on private health provisions or about pediatricians increasingly prescribing poverty blockers and hormones to young children. This is not going through the unit, but they, 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 they are encouraged to do that by the law. As a consense, uh, consequence, many questions arise from these alarming results. For example, I'll just mention a few. Why are there an increasing number of cases where sex is not recorded? Is it the Department of Health that sets the criteria for collecting data, or is it as the, as at the discretion of each unit? Now in Catalonia, there are six units. There was only one in Barcelona city. Now there are six in the territory. Uh, how is it possible that the sex of the person treated in a medical act, especially related to sex, is not recorded? Does the Department of Health have data on the scope of the affirmative, affirmative model in pediatrics without going through the unit? And in private healthcare, how many children and adolescents in Catalonia are receiving hormone treatments? We don't know. How many teens, how many girls? are having mastectomies, we don't know, or they will not tell us. What is the scientific evidence supporting these treatments and not only the evidence that, be, that is being published in other countries' uh, journals, but those that are treated by the unit in Catalonia beyond you know, the so-called evidence, international evidence that uh, is uh, usually uh, recalled? We don't know. How long does it take from the first visit until hormonal treatment is started in children, not in the unit, because we know that maybe it's within this 87% of uh, being prescribed hormones, cross-sex hormones at the first visit, but we don't know at a larger extent, include, as I say, pediatricians even in the public sector. How do referrals occur? For example, how do children treated end up going to this unit? What role do schools play? We suspect a high role, but we need to reconstruct that. What about trans activist entities that are the ones that the law, the Catalan law says that have to be consulted when any case arises in a school? We don't know. What are the treatment trajectories? What follow-up is done after hormone treatment is prescribed and how long is it follow-up? Are there people who once treated has start, treatment has started have wanted to abandon it? What is the protocol of action in this case? We don't know. But above all, to what does the Department of Health attribute the marked change in the demographic composition of the people served by the unit? 
And this exponential increase in both the global volume as well as among children and especially among adolescent girls. We don't even have news that they are asking them, themselves the question. We cannot accept that more and more children reject their sex bodies and especially that more and more adolescent girls do not want to become women without our society paying them the attention it owes while their health is irreversibly destroyed and they are doomed to pharmacological dependence for life, far from solving the reasons for their discomfort. As a society, we must remember increasingly hostile to girls in which they are subjected to increasing sexual violence while their male peers increasingly deny it. It is essential that independent investigations be initiated on gender identity units in all the regions of the country and that the affirmative model be revealed, asking the key questions that the trans bill currently and until um, still, sorry, uh, being discussed will prevent from being asked. Otherwise, we can be uh, charged with uh, transphobia or even fined. We begin to have equally alarming data from other autonomous communities that describe the same trends. So briefly, I think I can announce that on January 23rd, we're going to hold a webinar where you're invited, of course, to join. And we will show some of these trends nationwide. Trans laws and the affirmative model they promote in the face of the discomfort of minors with their bodies constitute a real attack on their integrity and development. We must repeal them all. They only serve to enrich a pharmaceutical industry of gender identity that has gone from profits of 8 billion euros to more than 3 trillion euros in the last five years at the expense of their health. Girls must be urgently protected and allowed to become women and join the Women's Declaration Right. Thank you.